What does it take to run four shows of Oppenheimer in 70mm each day for five weeks straight? Well, a lot of patience is a really good start, but I didn't actually run it that long. I only ran it for a few days, but the vast majority of things stay the same whether you're running it for one week or five. Other than your sanity, of course. I'm Thomas, and I'm a 70mm projectionist, and today I'm going to walk you through how all this works, answer some questions, and give you a little look into the booth. Stay tuned. Now, before I get any further, I want to make one very clear distinction. This is 70mm film, but not IMAX 70mm film. The film I'm running here is five perforations tall, while IMAX is actually a horizontal variant of 70mm that's 15 perforations wide. This is a common point of confusion, and it's quite understandable, but I just want to put that out there before we get any further. If you're looking for some IMAX 70mm content, I've linked a video in the description. So, what does it take to run 70mm film anyway? I'm going to keep this fairly surface level and break it into three categories. A film handling system, a film projector, and a sound system. Each of these plays a critical role in showing the film, and all of them must be functional for the movie to run. There will be minor variations here and there from system to system, but this is a good overview of a typical 70mm platter-based system that you'll find in the wild these days. First, the film handling system. This is what's called a film platter. It holds the entire movie spliced together all in one giant roll. On a platter, the film is paid out from the middle of one deck, pulled through the projector, and then taken up onto another deck with a removable center ring. When properly calibrated, this system will continuously feed the projector without intervention for the entire length of the film. That qualifier about calibration is important, and if it's not calibrated properly, all sorts of bad things can happen. You can end up with a print thrown on the floor, a brain wrap, or many other terrifying possibilities that are the nightmares of projectionists past and present. Platters do not require rewinding, so as soon as the movie is over, the projectionist can start preparing the next run without waiting for a giant, three-hour movie to be rewound. Thank goodness. The platter decks are motorized, and in combination with spring-loaded control arms, can adjust their speed throughout the movie as the circumference of the film donut changes drastically from beginning to end. There are numerous rollers on the film platter to ensure safe handling and proper tension throughout the many twists and turns to and from the film projector. Next is the projector. This is the most complicated, but as far as I'm concerned, interesting part of the process. This is a Cinemechanica Victoria 8, but the mechanics of film projection are universal between almost all machines. This is where the magic really happens. I say magic, but it's not actually that complicated, it's just really fast. In both film and digital projection, what you're seeing on the screen is not actually moving. What you're seeing is a series of still images played in rapid succession, which is enough to trick your brain into seeing motion that isn't really there. If you really saw something moving on the screen, it would appear blurry, and you wouldn't be able to make out any detail at all. To achieve this, we use a rotating shutter that blocks light when the film is moving, and projects light when the film is being held still in the aperture of the projector. This all happens very quickly. The standard frame rate for movies is 24 frames per second, and to avoid intense flicker, each frame is projected on the screen twice. The pull down from one frame to another happens at about 10 milliseconds. Once pulled down, the film then has to be held perfectly still for projection for another 31 milliseconds or so. Then the next frame is pulled down, and the cycle repeats 24 times per second. This is usually accomplished by a mechanism called a Geneva Drive, or Maltese Cross. Some projectors even used a servo motor for this, and they could pull down even faster for a brighter image, but those were much less common. Now, we need an intermittent motion for the image, but for just about everything else, we really want constant motion on the film. There's constant motion sprockets on the projector, which spin at a constant speed, but we need a buffer between the intermittent and constant motion, or we'll just destroy the film. That's why there's these loops at the top and bottom of the film gate, and that's where the film projector noise comes from. It's the film of this loop twisting, bending, and flapping around at 24 times per second in the air. The projector itself does not actually make that clacking noise, and it goes away as soon as the film runs out. Now, we'll also need some source of light to project the image on the screen, 
and that usually comes from a xenon lamp. In this case, we have a setup with a console, where the projector mounts to a big box with a lamp inside of it, and all the hardware required to power everything. The job of the lamp house is to concentrate the light produced by the xenon lamp and set it out the front into the film projector head. It also has the immensely important task of keeping the bulb cool and containing the shrapnel should the bulb decide to explode. There's two more important items on the projector that I haven't mentioned yet, but I'll get to those in just a minute. Lastly, the sound system. No modern movie would be complete without sound, but Oppenheimer in particular has a truly mind-blowing soundtrack, so it would be a real shame to go without it. Historically, 70mm film used magnetic audio, which could provide six tracks of analog audio with quite high fidelity. It did, however, not have the best durability, and made an already expensive format even more expensive. Today, we have digital sound on 70mm using the DTS system. DTS is quite a simple system conceptually, and it's actually a bit of a throwback to how we first did sound on film, with an external disc. On the film itself, there is a time code which specifies the movie, the real number, and the exact frame being played. A reader on the projector reads this time code and sends it to a DTS processor. From there, the processor plays the audio that has already been ingested from either a USB stick or a compact disc. While DTS is still a common name in home media, it's not the same system that's used in cinemas. It does, however, share the same 5.1 channel layout that you're probably used to. So, with all that out of the way, how do you run a 70mm movie? Well, let's walk through it. First, you need to clean basically everything. At the top of the projector, there's what are called particle transfer rollers, or PTRs for short. They have a tacky surface that will pick particles of dust and dirt off the film as it's running, and we need to clean those so we don't just stick the dirt back onto the print. Because that'd be bad. These need to be rinsed under running water between every show, so I usually do them first to make sure they have enough time to dry. Next, there's the film gate and trap. The film is squished between these two parts to hold it steady when it's being projected, so dust and dirt loves to get stuck to it. Then you need to clean all the sprockets and their teeth, and what better tool to clean teeth with than a toothbrush? No, really, this is actually the best way to do it, and if all you have is a cloth, you're going to be a little sad trying to use on the sharp sprocket teeth. It's also a good idea to give all the rollers and their guides and the projector and platter a good dusting. Now that everything's clean again, we can start threading. This varies a lot based on physical placement of things and the projector model, but the basic idea is the same. Put the payout head on the platter deck with the film, take out the center ring, and put the ring on the deck you want to be your take-up. Thread the film through the payout head, platter tree rollers, wall rollers if applicable, and then back to the take-up platter. Once the platter is threaded, you can thread the projector, ideally from the bottom up to keep him off the floor. In my particular case, this was very difficult due to the placement of the projector on a platform above the platter, and it's very close proximity to the wall. When threading the projector, it's important to make sure your loops are the right sizes to avoid scratches, and that you're in frame so the audience doesn't see an image that's split in the middle of the screen. Once everything is threaded and all the shoes are closed, you can check your work, then check it again, and then maybe a few more times. There's a whole lot of things that the film needs to go through, and missing even just one can put a line through the whole print if you're unlucky. Which would be a real bummer, because these prints are rare and incredibly expensive. Thankfully, the previous projectionist and myself kept this one in pristine condition. Once you're sure everything is all set, you can sit back and wait for the digital pre-show content to roll, and depending on how much content there is, prepare to sit for quite a while. Or, if you're completely paranoid like myself, you can use this time to check over your threading to be extra, extra sure you didn't screw it up. Once the pre-show content ends, you can switch the audio over, start the film projector, and wait for the leader to run through. Once you're at the green card, it's Dazzer open and image on screen. Oppenheimer had two previews included with a 70mm print, and after that, it's into the movie. I usually use this as a last chance to check for sound and focus before the movie hits the screen. Once everything is rolling and it all looks good, congratulations, you started a 70mm presentation of Oppenheimer. Now sit back, don't get too relaxed, and enjoy waiting for three hours as this movie runs and you have nothing to do. Except, not quite. You might not want to watch the movie, especially if you've already seen it like 25 times, but the projector itself, and all the hardware included, is gorgeous to watch in motion.
Now, I was originally planning on finishing this video with a Q&A section, but it ended up making the video over 30 minutes long. So instead, I'll make that a separate video, and I'll also add the answers to any questions you all leave me in the comments on this video. With that, I hope you all enjoyed, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again real soon. Bye-bye for now.